Yeah. Something you had more to offer that you, you could, that you should get out of that, you know, any way possible. What kept you going through those times? Um, faith in yourself? Yeah, I just don't, I don't have anything else I can do with my life, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this, is, this is what I do, <laughs> and um, I think it's things like that that make you stronger as a person. You just, you know, you refuse to, to give in. I mean, that, that predicament that I was in has killed a lot of artists' careers, right. you know, so many careers. Mm -hmm. And I feel, you know, I feel like, you know, at 32, you know, voice problems notwithstanding that I'm just getting started, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not going away, so I had to make a choice, you know, the way that I, the way I saw, the best way that I saw to handle that situation was just to try to, to try to get those people out of my life as quickly as possible, no matter what that meant doing. You know, so I just had, you know, I spent all of 1991, I spent 10 months on the road doing solo acoustic shows, driving around, you know, America and Europe in a rental car, staying at Motel 6's for 20 bucks a night, you know, with no, no crew, no one else, just going by myself, playing every night and really enjoying music because of that. It was very simple. I'd just show up with a guitar, play for two hours and go, go to another town. Uh, there was no, no big press hoopla, there was no record being promoted, it was just, it was about music and it was about, you know, divorcing myself from all the things that had happened. And I think spending all year doing that, I still, you know, all that time driving in the car and, you know, just those hours on the road every day, I had a lot of time to think about what to do next, you know, not to make another quick decision about, well... I get another big record contract, that'll take care of it, you know, they'll take care of me. It's like, no, I have to take care of this. When I get everything cleared out, then I can start over very slowly, and that's what this has been about. Hmm, that's amazing, so it was like, sort of, a, you're, you're handling the, the problem philosophically. It's yeah. Saying, Look, I, I can't depend on anybody anymore, I just gotta go out and do this on my own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and to create, you know, and to think about what environment I would like to set up to bring other people in, and that's where Sugar came from. I see. Yeah. Mark, people put in the situation of having to overcome what you had to overcome may be swayed to give up music because of other personal commitments, like mm -hmm. home or mm -hmm. you know, taking care of your parents or whatever. Yeah. In your case, you weren't uh, burdened by a type of, type of thing like that. You no. could just basically take off on your own. And, yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, we have those considerations now with Sugar. I mean, um, you know, David, our bass player, is uh, his wife is pregnant with their third child, and you know, I think the due date is late July. So you know, we have to cut off our touring, you know, at July fourth, and that's a you know three weeks before the birth, and we can't plan anything for a, for a good period after that because we just don't know what if the baby will be healthy or if there'll be complications. So I mean, you know, and that's fine. So you know, did you give that sort of consideration? Well, we have to. Uh -huh. You know, it's either that or there's no, there's no band. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, or we would have to replace him, which we don't want to do. You said it was the bassist, David. The bassist, yeah. Yeah, so do I. You know, and everybody's been, everybody, you know, at the record companies is very understanding. I mean, most of them, you know, a lot of the people have children, too. Uh -huh. and they, you know, they know. I think, you know, everybody's being very realistic about this. That's the difference this time, mm -hmm. you know. You know, with, with companies, you know, like Ryko and Creation, the main companies, they understand that, and they know that. They've known that since the beginning of the year. So they have six months to plan accordingly I see. for the for the year or so after mm -hmm. that that we may be taking time off. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a surprise. Right. You know, it's just right. it's a matter of just letting people know. Yeah, right. The, the personal events in your life that would sway the schedule of... Uh, like that? Um, exhaustion. <laughs> that would be the, that would be the only one. Hardly an event. Yeah, it's not one to look. It's not one to look forward to. <laughs> um, you know, I just you know again, I think I think quality is much more important than quantity as far as the amount of live performances and you know trying to. Be, I think so many people, you know, so many I think record companies and bands 
realize that they may only have one good year, you know, or that the band might only have one album in them. Mm-hmm. I mean, <coughs> I've been doing this long enough to know that you always have peaks and valleys, and the quicker you go to the top, the harder you fall. I mean, and I'm in no hurry to get to the top, you know, so that's, I think that's one of the big differences between what we do and what a lot of other bands do or are forced into doing. Mm. Mm. If, if you have no life outside of touring, you have nothing to write about. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so. Skull, I think he's a bit surprised at the commercial success of Copper Blue. Um, he hears it's even available in certain Kmart type stores yeah. in the Midwest. Yeah. Exactly. Well, the reason he's surprised is because the, the mood is rather somber, dark, if you will. Whoa. Wait till the next one. Um, no, that's probably the most optimistic record <laughs> I've ever made. <laughs> it's, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what to attribute the success of this record to. Maybe after years and years of being sort of ahead of what's been going on, maybe time has caught up with me, which is a scary thought. <laughs> you know? it makes a great headline, too. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> oh, dear. Um, you know, I think, I, think, I think in America, where we've had, you know, a great deal of success, Ryko has been so persistent. You know, they've just not given up for one day on the record. And that's that's what needs to be done in America. You have to just continually beat people over the head with it, because there's so much stuff out there. I think it's it's been a matter of good planning. You know, the record was finished in April, and it didn't come out until September. And we had a lot of time to plan a strategy to make sure that everything was in place and everything worked perfectly. Um, and just uh, everything. Business-wise, everything was focused, you know, artistically. I think, I think the record's are really f- pretty optimistic. I think, I think this time with some of the more melodic songs, uh, "If I Can't Change Your Mind" or "Hoover Dam." I think because they were so strong melody-wise and so unencumbered by big distorted guitars. You know, the people were able, you know, it, it allowed people to get more into the song. You know, not everything sounded the same. You know, there was a lot of variety on the record. And I think that um, it expanded the audience somehow. There was other people that came to it that may not have, that may not get past the wall of noise normally. So. Mm-hmm. You know, when you were on Warners or whoever, I don't know what are the labels, who's your with, but let's mm-hmm. say at the time they had spent the same sort of uh, efforts on Husker Do Stuff as they have on Sugar. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Husker would have sold as well. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. no, I think I think it was so, f- I think musically it was too far ahead of its time. Yeah. I just don't think people were ready for that kind of music yet. You know, it took Husker Do and then Sonic Youth and then Dinosaur Jr. and then Nirvana. You know, the you know, Husker Du's main purpose, beyond apparently influencing a handful of bands, you know, we were one of the first ones to start weakening the uh, the resistance to that kind of music. And, it took, you know, it's taken a number of years for right. people to accept the fact that you can have big, distorted, you know, uh, you know difficult-sounding guitars and, and drums really loud. But if the, you know, but with a lot of melody and a lot of intelligent lyrics, you know that's a you know noise and melody and intelligence is a combination that people just couldn't deal with until 1990. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think it would have I don't think it would have been any different. You know, even with that amount of energy. I see. So just like the U.S. has done that. Yeah, you 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 can understand what you mean about how the uh, the wall of resistance was broken down gradually. Mm-hmm. However. Now that we are in 1993, he says mm-hmm. rather than listening to Nirvana, he would rather listen to Sugar. That's Especially good. Especially like he likes to listen to it in his car. Uh-huh. He says if he put on, you know, uh, Husker Du in his car, he'd go straight into the car. Probably, yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably. <laughs> the, uh, the, the melodic uh, nature of Sugar Blue is, is how, uh, of Sugar is what um, is what makes the uh, the record sell. Mm-hmm. 
Well, uh, yeah, I think that there's there seems to be something for everyone on this record. Um, it'll it will be very interesting to see how the band is perceived. When